Colgate University. For videos, podcasts, and other digital resources, visit colgate.edu slash colgateconversations. The following interview is one of a series of Colgate Conversations on World Affairs, hosted by Colgate University President Jeffrey Herbst. Welcome to this Colgate University Conversation on World Affairs. I am President Jeffrey Herbst, and with me in the studio today is Daniel C. Kritzer, whose career includes service as U.S. Ambassador to both Egypt and Israel during the years 1997 through 2005. Since then, Ambassador Kurtzer has continued to serve as a policy advisor. He now holds an endowed visiting professorship in Middle East Policy Studies at Princeton University. Co-author of Negotiating Arab-Israeli Peace, American Leadership in the Middle East, he is at Colgate to talk about the Arab Spring and the future of the Middle East. Welcome, Dan. Thank you very much. The Arab Spring is obviously one of the great world historic events of our time confusing, lots of things happening, uh, diversity of outcomes in different countries. Looking at the long sweep of Arab history, how would you put current events into place? Look, I think there was an assumption both in the uh, academic world as well as among policymakers that uh, authoritarianism was not just the, uh, the current uh, way of leadership, but was somehow endemic to Arab society, maybe even to Arabism. And you, in fact, find in some of the literature the idea that Arabs are incapable of, uh, of promoting uh, what we would call democratic governance. So on the, uh, at the first instance, uh, what the Arab Spring has challenged is this uh, basic bias. Uh, uh, it looks like there is a possibility of at least uh, some form of democracy evolving in places like Egypt and Tunisia, maybe in Libya. The ferment elsewhere suggests that uh, this may be a trend that may take time evolving, but may not, uh, it may be the genie that's out of the bottle and can't be put back in. So I, I think both in uh, academic uh, study of the region, but also in broad historical terms, this is quite a, a change that we're witnessing. Given so much happening at the moment, it's important, it's difficult and imp but important to sort out uh, events. If we were to kind of fast forward 10 years and look back at what's happening today, what would you pick out as the most important developments? I think there are probably uh, uh, two that stand out and then a, a, a number that surround it uh, in importance. Number one is the um, speed with which uh, dictators have fallen. Uh, watching Hosni Mubarak rule for over 30 years and then be pushed out not only by the masses in Tahrir Square but also by his own colleagues in the military in a period of 18 days. Uh, watching Gaddafi fall, seeing the uprising against the Assad uh, regime in Syria uh, really is, is uh, quite amazing. Uh, second, uh, I've been particularly uh, interested in the turn of the Egyptian revolution towards constitutionalism. You know, revolutions can go in a lot of different directions, and I think the Egyptian revolution will go in many directions. But from almost the first day after Mubarak's fall, the debate about the constitution and the nature of society in Egypt has really predominated. And I, I think it's really, it's, I think it's not understood well in the West, uh, the degree to which this is important to Egyptians. In the end, maybe it will not prove as important uh, in terms of the durability of the revolution. But at this stage, uh, 18 months into this, I think it's quite extraordinary that they're, they're focused so much on building institutions and getting the right mix of powers and responsibilities, uh, quite unlike the chaos that some people predicted. Do you think where we've seen revolts overthrow um, in North Africa, tumult in Syria, some tumult in Bahrain. Um, do you think that's the high watermark of popular protests against authoritarian regimes, or is this just a moment before potentially another wave? I think it's, it's a moment, but um, one doesn't know now whether it's another wave of the democratization trend or whether it's the rebounding of the authoritarian trend. Some of that, I think, will depend on um, the regional mood in the aftermath of whatever happens in Syria. 
if Assad uh, and his regime stay in power, um, it will be a setback uh, because it will also demonstrate to the region that a, a uh, determined authoritarian leader is not going to really face a problem from the West uh, by using as much force and, and coercion as Assad has done. Uh, on the other hand, uh, one sees now uh, disruptions in Jordan. Saudi Arabia is in ferment, in part because of the Arab Spring, in part because of succession. Uh, so I, I don't think we're anywhere near the end of this book yet. You mentioned how quickly things are evolving, and that's important to note. One of the things people had picked up on at a particular moment uh, in these revolts is that monarchies seem to be faring better or were more stable uh, mm -hmm. than regimes led by civilians or military officers. Do you think that was just an epiphenomenal, or do you think there's something to that uh, over the long term? I think there actually is something to it. And uh, on the one hand, uh, there is a sense of legitimacy that these monarchies have that uh, some of the so-called republics, the authoritarian republics, did not. Um, and particularly in societies where the, um, s the nation state, the modern nation state came into being coterminous with the rise of the monarchy, Jordan as an example. Um, without the monarchy, it's really a question of whether Jordan has the, the, the wherewithal, the, the substance, to, uh, to claim uh, kind of a, a statehood, to make a statehood claim. Um, so I think that's a factor that, that uh, has to be taken into account. On the other hand, what's interesting is uh, the revival of interest in the Huntington, the, the king's dilemma, the, the, the question of the modernizing monarchy that uh, faces up to challenges from those elites who not only want to benefit economically and socially, but actually then want to share power. And that's where the monarchies, maybe enjoying the legitimacy, will now face the challenge. Are they able to open up the society and, in a sense, effect a transformation from what they are to some constitutional monarchy as a way station towards something else? Democracies vary. Uh, democracies in Western Europe vary. Switzerland operates very differently than the UK. But as these countries evolve, and presumably some are successful in building democratic institutions, will we be able to say there is an Arab democracy model that differs in some salient ways from the democratic forms found elsewhere in the world? Well, uh, the, the question, I think, is, uh, it's not only a good question, but there's also a s second aspect to it, which is, um, will there be an Arab form of democracy or an Islamist form of democracy? Um, and so far, what we're seeing is the beginning of what, what might be the Islamist uh, democracy, uh, Egypt being the prime example, where 75% of the population voted for uh, Islamist candidates in uh, the parliamentary election, and you now have an Islamist uh, president. Uh, when parliamentary elections are held again, one can imagine there will be a substantial majority for Islamist parties. And uh, it will uh, evolve in ways that are quite different from Western democracy. Um, one immediate uh, uh, question and concern is going to be in the area of both human rights and, and women's rights. Uh, can Islamists uh, open up society in a way uh, that we expect Western democracies to act um, when it comes to uh, equal access and equal equality in the workplace and elsewhere? And I, I don't think they can, but how they wrestle with it will, um, it will emerge somehow as this Islamist form of democracy. Are there now democratic philosophers, democratic theorizers at work in the Arab world, the Islamic world, to address these questions of what their form of democracy will look like? Or have events gotten ahead of them? Well, events surely uh, <clears throat> have gotten ahead of the theorists. Um, the closest you've seen on the ground was this, uh, there was a committee of wise men, which tells you something. It wasn't, was, wasn't wise men and women. It was wise men in Egypt. But they were much more of a um, stabilizing force, trying to find some ground between the regime that people wanted to see move on 
and the unknown uh, that would emerge from Tahrir, um, not so much on the theorizing or you know, none of the federalist debates that we, we experienced, uh, there may be uh, that phenomenon underway. I'm not aware that it's a, a very far advanced if it is happening. What is interesting though is, as opposed to, to the federalist model, there is a very significant debate within uh, particularly the Muslim Brotherhood community. Uh, their websites are full of very interesting back and forth about what it means to be Islamist and democratic and uh, can they live with uh, Coptic Christians and women in leadership roles and what does that mean for their religious ideology. Uh, a youth uh, uh, rebellion in some respects with a, a generation gap between the entrenched leadership and, and uh, those who want to be new entrants into leadership. So it's happening in that community. I'm not aware that it's, it's happening in the broader society. One of the questions that sometimes comes up in democratization uh, is what, to use another vocabulary from another time, is the national question. And as you know, the existence of individual nation states within the Islamic world has been debated, uh, given that Islam does not necessarily recognize um, uh, the uh, uh, viability value of these individual states, but their sovereignty nonetheless right. has been protected ferociously by individual leaders. Do you think there will be that debate, or do you think the map, such that it is, is going to be pretty stable? Well, if there has been... Um a unifying trend in the Arab world, it is the fear of changing the map until now. Um, everybody wants the map changed uh, according to their own preferences, but once you open up uh, uh, that can of worms, um, too much will escape. And uh, So I think the, the easy analysis would suggest that that will not be part of the, maybe the next stage of these uh, upheavals. But you know, a situation in Syria could develop, for example, where effectively the country gets partitioned. And if it gets partitioned on the ground in a manner, for example, where the Kurds believe that their um, autonomy ideals uh, can be advanced, uh, you could start to see the Kurdish question, which in a sense is transnational, cuts across three or four states, um, uh, raise this question to the fore. Other than that Syria um, opening, I, I don't I don't think others will want to reopen the question, but it's there. It's been there for a long time. In the narrative of the Arab Spring, where does Iraq fit in? Um, I assume that George W. Bush is going to claim um, uh, in his, even in his next set of memoirs that uh, he is the uh, grandfather or the father of, that, uh, of the revolution that's sweeping the region. And, and to be fair, um, the, the Bush agenda certainly caught people's attention in the region. Uh, a, a lot of us here thought it was a little bit too much hot air and a little bit too, um, too much American, uh, an American attempt to dictate the terms of governance in other societies. <clears throat> but his words had resonance in, in the region, the idea of a transformational agenda that uh, that uh, carried the Bush administration at least during its middle years from about 2004 to 2007 or so. Uh, and those words mattered, as did President Obama's speech in Cairo and the idea that maybe the United States would in fact be supportive of those uh, uprisings. So, um, you know, it's a factor. I wouldn't overstate it, but uh, uh, I think the Arab world now is going to wait and see if we live up to the words uh, in, in terms of the support that we we provide, and until now, I think the uh, uh, the current administration has done pretty well in balancing, you know, traditional uh, stability requirements and traditional alliances with these emerging trends. We could talk obviously for a long time about these fascinating issues. Let me take advantage of your diplomatic service by asking one final question, segueing from your answer, which is, what do you think are the most constructive steps both the American government and American society could take as these dramas develop across the Arab world? Well, I think we have a lot to fix at home. Uh, and by that I mean, uh, uh, in the first instance, our foreign affairs budget. You know, it, it, it's not special pleading. I no longer have a position in government. 
but uh, we don't have enough Arabists in the Middle East. We don't have enough resources to ensure that training in regional studies uh, accompanies every assignment. Uh, you're in the military, you get an assignment, you're going to do training. In the State Department, you get an assignment and they want you there the next day. Uh, sometimes the department's lucky because you happen to know something and most often you don't. Uh, that also means that uh, there are openings here for universities. Uh, Colgate, I understand, is interested in expanding its uh, global programs and I think it's the perfect time to do that. Uh, hopefully there will be a community that will support that. Uh, a, just making the uh, community of graduates aware of our interests in this region, but also maybe inducing uh, some of the graduates to actually go into public service for a while and uh, to uh, represent us in, in the region. So I think at home we have things that we have to fix to get us ready to do what we were not doing as effectively in the past. Uh, in the region, I, I think the, the most important first step right now is right-sizing our presence and our interests. And I'll give you two examples. Uh, when I was the ambassador in Egypt, I had 2,200 people working for me. I didn't need 2,200 people. I didn't want 2,200 people. But we had 19 agencies of government all competing to do what they wanted to do. And we had this huge embassy that in itself became part of the problem. Um, that has to be right-sized. Our presence in the Gulf needs to be right-sized. We have a very large naval presence. Once. Uh, uh, the Iraq uh, chapter is fully closed and Afghanistan is closed, do we really need to have a fleet based in Bahrain and a large presence elsewhere in the Gulf? So these are big challenges that um, you know, often get uh, neglected because of the day-to-day -day crises, but you know, we've got to grapple with them sooner or later. Dan, thank you so much. Thank you for this discussion, and of course, thank you for visiting Colgate. Thanks. Pleasure.